Hello, everyone, and welcome to an EA conference interview. My name is Michelle Dench. I'm an astrologer and the administrator for the Jeffrey Wolf Green um, Association of Evolutionary Astrologers. And we are organizing the first ever EA online conference for the association. And this coming October, it's the week of October 6th, 7th, and 8th dedicated to the Pluto paradigm. So we are bringing together an incredible team of evolutionary astrologers and focusing with each of those astrologers on a topic that is very core to their teaching. And um, today I'm joined with Bradley Narragon, who I'm really excited to learn a little bit more from. Bradley, if you would like to introduce yourself to everyone, I'd love to hear more about what brought you to EA and your practice as an astrologer and as an artist. Hello, thank you for thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, what brought me to EA? Uh, I already said I wasn't going to get personal, but it's a really personal story, actually, that, that I um, almost never have told people, but I think I'm ready to tell it. That's kind of dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I know I want to cry. <laughs> um, well, so I started studying astrology in December of 98, and I knew nothing about evolutionary astrology. I moved out to Washington State in 2000. I had Pluto books, but... I was one of those people that I had the Pluto books and maybe I like mm. looked up my Pluto. I did not like, I just, I did not really get the paradigm or have it absorbed at all. You know, it's like they were part of my book collection. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I did not know EA at all until I think it was 2009, 2009, 2010. So what happened was I met this astrologer in town and we decided to hang out and she came over. We looked at each other's charts and I showed her my chart and uh, both of my children's charts. So first of all, what she shared with me about my chart, I was really, I was shocked. I mean, I was just kind of like, flabbergasted I, I like where are you seeing this in the chart she was really hitting home on some deep core stuff that no one had told me from my chart before so I was just like what is going on like what is this astrology that you study um then she also said something that just like hit me so deep that I struggled with it for years which was <laughs> She looked at one of my children's charts and she said that um, at the time I was using cannabis daily and she said that, you know, if you continue to do this, your child is going to develop uh, exaggerated neurotic um, tendencies and, and it's going to be create more suffering for them. And so I lived with a lot of, um, I guess, like, questions around that and and guilt on some level for many years as i like processed that but um you know that that was pretty deep and and heavy but ea is kind of like that sometimes it just like hits you really like what yeah so <laughs> but um so I, I was like i gotta learn this stuff like what is she talking about how did she see this in my chart at the time i went online and that's when the school of evolutionary astrology had just kind of relaunched their new website and Deva was just kind of like getting underway and Steve and Deva were just like on the message board. And um, so, yeah, I, I looked at what was online. And I decided to go with the school of EA because uh, Jeffrey is the source of the material in terms of what I understood. Uh, and that's how I like to roll. And so I just dove into that and got the, the books. I think I carried Pluto book run around for, you know, like over a year every day at the time I was taking the bus to work. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, I just read it every day and, and I realized how little I understood the paradigm 
Mm. And I was on the message board, you know, every day and just really dove in and I was doing readings for donation for a while just to really get an opportunity to understand how it worked. And then it just kind of like made sense suddenly. Mm. So. <laughs> it's like, it's got to get you somehow, you know, it's, if it's not a Pluto transit, it's like a Plutonian astrologer coming in and, you know, putting, putting the energy right on that spot of greatest tenderness. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. 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 Thanks and how, time. how have you seen your practice as an astrologer evolve since you in, integrated this work? Um, hmm. yeah, well, great question. I think that in hindsight, when I look back to my first decade or so as an astrologer, I did do some readings, you know, uh, over the years, I, I, I did them consistently, not a lot, but I was also one of those people that I got really nervous and I prepared so much information. Um, I knew I, I was able to understand the technical mathematical side of things and find a lot of correlations and links in time. It was one of those things where people would be, they'd say they really liked the reading, but then in a year from then, it felt like they didn't remember anything. It was like, mm -hmm. well, what am I, what am I giving people? What, what's out of this? And, and the thing with EA that I, I've loved is there's a certain simplicity where, you know, it's like, if, if somebody leaves, I kind of think of this thing of like, if they left and they remembered one key thing that was a core soul dynamic that could help them in the rest of their lifetimes, that's huge because I'm going from a place where it's just like mental masturbation or something. Mm -hmm. And am I even helping people? And with EA, it was kind of like, these are some really core things. And so I really simplified uh, how I approach and really became a student of how do I meet people where they're at and how is this going to be useful for them where they're at right now and and so I mean I still prepare for readings definitely you know I, I need to take some time and sit with it and see what comes and sometimes stuff just comes in the moment sometimes the greatest stuff just as you know kind of will just come in a flash and then so just trying to be open to, um, you know, being a vessel for some of this stuff to come through. Uh, so it's changed a lot. And I mean, I, I do focus on the EA paradigm as the core, but a lot of times I'll weave back to that um, and just kind of see what comes up because it all leads back to it eventually. <laughs> so just kind of start where we're at and see where that leads. So. Yeah, it's it changed a lot of how I approach readings. Mm -hmm. Is there one thing in particular from the paradigm that you feel like, you know, has made the biggest Im influence in your focus? Hmm. I mean, I guess the one thing is, um, I mean, I use the word lens a lot. I think that's in the title of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the it's like the lens of the whole paradigm actually changed my consciousness and my experience of all reality. Like it's like taking mushrooms or something, you know. <laughs> uh, it's a real trip, and it just um, I think that when you begin to see dynamics at a soul level. Uh, even if you're stuck in the same pattern, even if you can see your own pattern you know, and you're, you watch yourself do it and you watch yourself create the same karma again, it's different because you've been given this objective lens. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like the download of the whole thing changed my perception of all reality. So without, and the, all the pieces tie together. So it's hard for me to take one, one piece, you know, and, and say, that makes sense. Well, I mean, I, I personally know for me that the, 
there are aspects of evolutionary astrology that have been most impactful. And I think they are probably the things that are most impactful in the chart. And like in my own chart, um, for example, Jeffrey Wolf Green's teachings on retrograde planets and, um, you know, planets that square the nodes in particular. Mm -hmm. And I have core planets that square the nodes and the planets that square the nodes for me are also the retrograde planets, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the, it's Here created an intensification of where both as a soul, where I feel that calling to resolve this dynamic. And I relate a lot to what you were just saying around how you can see yourself doing the same thing again and again. And like, even if the awareness is there, how helpful it is to be able to be given a soul level perspective of why and what is happening. Mm -hmm. So then it's not just suffering for the sake of being an ignorant human being or being incapable of changing, right? There's like, yeah. um, but anyways, that's, that's a bit of what I have personally, like, I want to understand this it comes from this deeper desire of like, I want to understand this and I need to under, in order to understand it. And maybe it's because I'm a Gemini moon. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I have to know what this is and figure out how to resolve it in this lifetime. <laughs> um, it might not be as, as, uh, as intense for you, <laughs> but yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, now that you say that, I think that if I guess, I like I like how you got into that 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 helps me understand the question a little bit because I think that it kind of seems like in a similar way what was has been most meaningful for me is what's actually personal for me and you know the ruler of my north node is Venus and Pisces in the first house and so I have a lot of Capricorn I'm learning uh, unconditional self-love and unconditional love and what that means and I think that there's a lot of things in the EA paradigm that um, have helped me with that you know and I think like one of the things in particular is this whole concept of uh, desire and obviously like EA is based on this paradigm that the soul has desires so we incarnate Mars is the lower octave of those desires and in a lot of um, spiritual communities, there's a lot of talk of, um, you know, I like there's this thing about there's the desires we have and then there's the choices that we make. And we have a lot of, we can, you know, it's just like, I guess EA is kind of giving me this lens to watch myself from the inside and acknowledge uh, desires that emanate from the primary brain that are simply natural that are occurring regardless of what psychological construct I've been taught or I put above them but I can just I've gotten to a place where with the EA paradigm it's like help helped me even like come to terms with I have these desires they naturally exist that's okay and it doesn't mean I'm going to act on them <laughs> you know like like some kind of contextualization to um, uh, I guess kind of resolve the inner conflict of my own um, psychological conditioning that I came in with and that from society and and, um, and culture that clashes with um, us on an internal level where we're kind of like struggling to accept ourselves as we naturally exist as EA teaches this, you know, natural law. Um, so something around that, I guess, has been huge. I mean, I still think about this every day in terms of um, uh, desire and ego and identity and and this whole thing of, you know, like like in, in EA being on the wheel of karma is, is there's this whole thing of like you came here so it's like you need to you need to act out your desire like why did you come like what are you here to do what do you want to do and not not just like following um 
sensual pleasure impulses, although that, that could be part of what one's desires were that they need, they need to do that or something, you know, until they're, they're done or they're exhausted. But, um, you know, there's this kind of intersection of um, morals and values and ethics and desire and cultural conditioning and psychological conditioning and how all of those things can be kind of unraveled to a point where we can accept who we are and not try to be like, I'm just going to try to like get rid of all my desires because like EA doesn't teach that at all. You know, it's like, you're not going to get rid of your ego and you're not going to get rid of your desires. So like, what did you come here to do? <laughs> <laughs> Something around that. Like, I don't know. It's kind of a, a, a lot, but you know, that makes sense. I think it's a great, it's a great point of how the framework of EA can be really helpful. Um, cause it, I can, you know, I think that the Pluto bottom line desire thing makes so much sense to me. Like, it's so simple We we're creatures of desire, we maybe creatures of habit, but even habit is a desire, right? It's a, and in my perspective, like that bottom line desire to return to source is kind of the the empty well that everyone is trying to fill anyways. We and we seem to be trying to fill it through relationship, through substance, you know, through whatever fill in the blank um thing that might try and get in that empty well, but if, if the bottom of the well is simply just the desire to return to source, then the process of exhausting those desires is like getting to the bottom of the well, you know? And I haven't, I certainly haven't gotten there. And I think a part of what I've been reflecting on a lot lately is like what to do when those desires come with really strong attachment or they come with such deep or significant longing that we don't have a way to be in the world without some part of us moving towards the fulfillment of that or moving towards the resolution. And I, I hear you saying like, oh, it's possible to even have desires and not, um, you know, not fulfill them. Like, I I studied Buddhism for a long time before I came to evolutionary astrology and I would spend so much time on the meditation retreat thinking about what I was going to eat <laughs> when we were done with retreat I'd have like my whole foods shopping <laughs> list I'm ready to go to the grocery store I'm pretty certain I'm going to make a pie or some quiche, you know, and everything, all of my, you know, meta, all my loving kindness practice is spent thinking about, well, the eggs and cheese, and it, definitely they'll have a frozen pie crust. And, you know, just to get done with the retreat and um, release that desire by fulfilling, you know, and it was, it was kind of groundbreaking to me to stay in the present moment and not actually go through with like actually not trying to do that, not trying to get there, but just being. And so that's kind of what I heard you saying when you were sharing about desire and, and the EA perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really easy to think that we're in a certain place, but then when something comes along that activates our deepest desires, um, like this whole um, story that we've told ourselves about who, who we are or where we're at <laughs> might need to get adjusted because we act upon this desire that's stronger than um, what we thought it was or something. Mm -hmm. that yeah that whole intersectionality is really fascinating to me and um there's definitely a lot there it's a, it's a big topic really I, <laughs> I don't know we don't have time to go into all this but yeah, <laughs> yeah huh. and so what you're focusing on for the conference is seeing through the lens of the planetary nodes and so for for people who don't have any idea what 
planetary nodes are. Could you give us a little like spiel? Oh, right. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like um it's like the moon has nodes, but then the planets have nodes because they they kind of they there's a point where they they cross the the plane, the orbital plane, and then they go up and then they cross where they go below. It's kind of it's kind of the same concept as the lunar nodes. And so one is the north node where it crosses and goes up. And then exactly opposite that, if you're standing on the sun, exactly opposite is the, the, the south node of, of a planet. And so, you know, um, it's that simple concept of in EA, we have this, this trinity of past, present, future, so to speak. Uh, and so the in the terms of the planetary nodes, the south nodes uh, move well, the nodes just move really slow for the planets, right? Um, hundreds of years. So we're talking about um, huge chapters of time, um, kind of like the ages and sub ages um, that these nodes correlate to for the planets. Uh, and do you see them as more like sub nodes to the planetary function itself? Right. Um, I guess my I see them as part of the fabric of this reality. Like, um, like they're so tied to um, our experience of the archetypes as they exist right now that we think that we're seeing Gemini, but we're seeing Gemini with the North Node of or experiencing Gemini with the north nodes of Venus and Uranus and Ceres in a conjunction there, but we don't know that. And so we have, um, and so we, in my experience, um, I see a lot of times where people will um, represent the archetypes. Someone just, I just saw someone do Libra memes and the Libra memes were so Scorpio. And of course I was like, yeah, it's because Libra suns have all these Scorpio South nodes. So this, but they don't think that they're, they're projecting Scorpio archetypal patterns on Libra sun sign. Um, and so in the sense, like we don't see Libra sun sign and Libra, and then we've got a whole Pluto Libra generation too. So, you know what I'm saying? So that like, what I see, what I've seen is that we're so in it that we're, we're not able to uh, realize fully the lens that we're looking through because yeah. we've only looked through this lens for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I'm going to get into in the talk is like, what are these lenses that we're always looking through? I mean, we kind of, we do have a sense of what the peer archetype Gemini means, but we're experiencing Gemini in, in a very specific evolutionary context relative to the, the Neptune Pluto conjunctions in Gemini and the planetary north nodes that are in Gemini. So <clears throat> the entire evolution of humanity is being kind of like, like the fabric of, of this whole tapestry of this dramatic journey that we're on. It has this Gemini themes in it. It's mm -hmm. part of this at larger evolutionary theme, but we don't think of that when we just think Gemini. But that's as like, we'd have to go back thousands of years to step out of our lens. Wow. So. Well, that sounds amazing. I'm really looking forward to it. And I wonder if there's anything else that you want to share about what you plan to bring forward to the conference or what you're most looking forward to unpacking in that talk. Um, I mean, I'm really excited to feel like, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I've always loved the community and um, I felt as though I've drifted for some years here on the, and I've just kind of been coming out back out the last couple of years out of my little cave here. So uh, I'm excited to feel like I'm part of this larger group uh, of people. And I, I really, I do know um, a lot of the people from years ago and really love them and I'm excited to, to, to participate and listen to everybody and, and have the whole experience of the conference really, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It feels like a fun, we did a, a series last year as 
and association and um, the team of teachers that led that series, Kristen Fontana, Ari Moshe, um, Rose Marcus, Rav Shahal, and Deva, you know, they each took a turn in, and they're part of our core team of teachers. And I think even in this coming year, we'll be looking to do another series, but this conference is like a widening of the community and bringing more people together who have taught together, learned together, like really peers who are, um, you know, exceptional. And, and we're super excited to have you be a part of that. And for anyone who's wanting to enroll, the conference is open for enrollment. You can see the full conference schedule and everything at JWG aea.org forward slash EA conference. And there will be a link in the show notes and you can use the coupon code Pluto, the word Pluto to get a discount on your registration. So for anyone who's watching, if you want to join us, it's going to be two full days of lectures from 14 different teachers, and then a an introduction to the Pluto Paradigm full workshop on Friday that kicks off the conference. And it will just really be a wonderful, you know, reconnecting of community. Additionally, on the JWG AEA website is a forum, which is kind of a continuation of the original message board. A lot of the original moderators of the message board are there and um, it's become a place where you can bring questions and really work out the EA paradigm. So that is um, growing and, you know, evolving right along with everything. So thanks so much for being with us today, Bradley. And it's great to get to know you a little bit and um, really appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you for your work on the, with the evolutionary astrology and helping get everything up and running with the new message board it really it's really a gift to the community so thank, thank you. you i'm happy to be a part of it it's one way that the pluto paradigm has manifested in my life in a very unexpected way <laughs> so uh, continuing part of my evolutionary journey and i'm really grateful to be of service in this way Thank you. Thanks for having me. I look forward to participating. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.